Hello, I believe I'm live on uh, Lizzie Daly's Wildlife TV channel. This is Earth Live Lesson, so thank you very much for joining me. If I'm, um, yeah, if I'm a little bit distracted, it's because my son just bought me a cup of tea, which was lovely. So I'm going to have a quick sip of that. Thank you ever so much for joining me. If you have any questions as we go through the lesson, then please put them in the questions on, on the uh, live chat and I'll do my best to answer them as we go through. So you're probably wondering who I am. I'm Dr. Angela Katwa. I'm an earth scientist. And if you don't know what an earth scientist does, we are scientists who are really interested in rocks, fossils and landforms and the stories they can tell us about earth history. So that's what we do. So basically, I do pretty much what everybody else on the Earth Live lessons have been talking about, except I deal with dead creatures buried in rocks. So yeah, and I'm going to show you a couple. I've got some set out on my desk here, and we'll go through a couple of those with you. So a good place to start is if you're interested in Earth sciences um, and you love rocks and fossils, um, where do you start? Um, for me, uh, probably since about eight years old, I wanted to be an astronaut. And unfortunately, that didn't quite work out. Um, but actually, I still loved science. And when I was about 12 years old, I went to Kenya on holiday with my family. So I grew up in Slough, a very urban environment. Um, didn't have, you know, didn't have that much time in nature. But my family were from East Africa. So we used to go over there to, to see some of my mother and father's family that were still in Nairobi. And it was on a trip, I was about 12 years old, and it was a trip when I was out in the East African Rift Valley with my family. We came across an ancient lava flow, and I picked up two pieces of solidified ancient lava here. Look, I've still got them. Isn't that amazing that I'm going to show the camera? Look at these two pieces of lava. I was 12 years old when I picked this up, and please don't ask me how old I am now because I just had a birthday. Uh, <laughs> I picked those two pieces of lava up and that was it. I was completely blown away by what geology could tell us about the landscape and about Earth history. What really kind of made me think about becoming an Earth scientist was I was walking across this ancient lava flow and I just thought, God, if it was real, my legs would be melting. I'd be sinking into this molten rock. And at that point, I decided... I, I love space and I love science, but this in particular, this whole story about the earth and rocks, that's what I wanted to do with my life. And then I went on to study a degree in earth science at university, and then I went on to a PhD, which is a postgraduate degree. So normally you would do a, a degree in earth science or something like that. You do your master's and then you do a doctorate. So that's what I did. And then I, after that, I went off to the US, worked there for about four years, doing all sorts of things. Um, had a fantastic job with the National Park Service in the US, working as an interpreter and a science communicator, as well as a research scientist. And then I came back to the UK. And actually, I was so fortunate at that time, I was offered a job to work for the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site to manage and develop and start up a learning program. And to be honest, that's where I cut my teeth, I would say, on science communication. And Suddenly, I was transported into this incredible world of fossils and rocks um, from the Triassic, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period. So what I'm going to do in today's lesson is really if you are at school, particularly if you're in key stage two, um, a lot of what you're studying um, in year three is about rocks and fossils. And one of the key questions I get asked as an earth scientist is what is a fossil and how are they formed? And so we'll just talk about that a little bit now. Obviously, if you have any questions, um, you know, put them in the box. Someone's just asked me, have I ever seen a dinosaur? Well, uh, usually I do see a dinosaur every other week because my daughter dresses up in one in fancy dress. So, yeah, <laughs> if you have a dinosaur costume, you'll have to send me photos on Twitter or Instagram. If you can follow me as Jurassic Girl. And if you put a one instead of the eye, you'll you'll see me popping up on Twitter. Hey, someone is in Key Stage 2. Hi, Sarah. And um, right. Let's start off with what a fossil is. So a fossil is the remains or the traces of an organism or a process that is now encased in rock. You know, we're talking about organisms and processes that existed millions and millions of years ago. And I'm just gonna show you a choicey one here. Look at this beautiful fossil here. Look at that, isn't that gorgeous? Can't see me, my 
Look at that. That's a beautiful, I wonder if you can guess what it is. This is called an ammonite and it's a spiral shaped creature and it's encased in a rock. You can see the color of the rock. It's a gray rock, it's called limestone. And these beautiful creatures uh, lived in the Jurassic seas about 185, 200 million years ago. That's really quite extraordinary, isn't it, when you look at that. Now, fossils form because life has to die at some point. So let's, let's pretend that this is my ammonite here. Here he is, look, that's his fossil now. And we're going to pretend that this is our living creature. So ammonites, they lived in the Jurassic Seas about 185, 200 million years ago. They would have been swimming, you know, across the seabed. There he is. Off he goes. Off he goes. Usually ammonites swim backwards because they have a little tube here, which they pump air out of, which propels them through the water. So at some point, our poor little ammonite would have felt very ill. He would have died. And what would have happened was his body would have sunk to the bottom of the seabed. Now, most organic creatures have soft body tissue here, like his head, and inside his body had lots of muscle. Over time, that soft body part would rot or it get eaten away by other animals or scavengers. And what you're left behind with are the hard body parts. And in this case, we're talking about the shell of the ammonite. Now, that shell of the ammonite would stay on the bottom of the seabed, okay? All the soft body parts have gone now. And over time, that shell gets buried under layers and layers and layers of rock. And that shell starts to get buried and it starts to change. The minerals in the shell start to change. And literally what happens over hundreds of millions of years is that the shell actually literally turns to stone. So, so Sarah is asking, is it stuck in the rock? It's kind of buried in the rock. So, so if we're talking scientifically, it's not stuck in the rock, it becomes buried as part of the rock. It becomes part of the rock itself. So it's layer, it's buried under layers and layers of rock. All sorts of changes happen to the shell, changes the chemistry of the shell. And what you end up with is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful fossil like this. Now, this is a really interesting fossil. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw that ammonite over there. You can see part of the shell is a creamy color and part of the shell is dark. And the reason why we have this is that the creamy colored part of the shell is filled with a mineral called calcite. And that's, that's a mineral that exists in the water, the sea water. And what's really interesting is that the, the body of the creature would have existed in this gray part of the shell here. Now, where that soft body tissue would have rotted or been eaten away by scavengers, that part of the body would have filled in by the mud on the seabed, so muddy water. The rest of the shell would have been filled with air and that's filled with calcite filled water and that's what's left behind there. So it's a really, really interesting story about this fossil. The other thing, when I found it, and my friend Richard Edmonds, who prepared it for me, he's a fossil collector, he lives in Lyme Regis, um, he noticed that there was a little bite mark in the shell itself, a V-shaped bite mark. And what that suggests is that this ammonite might have been attacked by another creature, like a belemnite, and that creature would have sucked out the soft body of the ammonite, a bit like a milkshake through a straw. I know it's really horrid, isn't it? But that's how sometimes creatures die and get eaten. So yeah, that's an ammonite. Inside the ammonite is really, really interesting. So we've got this beautiful fossil. Check that out, guys. Sorry, I'm going to angle it so we don't get a reflection. Look at that. So this is another ammonite. They, they used to be called sea snails. So you are right, Sarah. It does look very much like a snail. And spirals are probably one of the really key patterns that we see in nature. But inside the, the shell of the ammonite, you can see these chambers. They're called the body chambers. And what the ammonite used to do was pump air in and out of the chambers, and that would have helped it in terms of its buoyancy to move and propel itself through the water. So it's a bit like an aqualung, really. The more air you have in your body, the more buoyant you are in the water. If the ammonite was to squeeze the air out of its shell, it would sink. So it, it was a way of the ammonite actually controlling its motion through the water. That's what these body chambers were used for. So... Those are some ammonites. Now, rocks are indeed really fascinating things. I think when you, wherever you live right now, um, especially in this lockdown period, 
<coughs> wherever you live, there is an interesting story under your feet. And if, if you go over to my YouTube channel, once you've watched this show and you Google Dr. Angela Katwa, or you follow the link in the description, you'll see a new series that I've created during lockdown called Where on Earth Do You Live? And this is all about me trying to help you at home understand the incredible stories locked in, locked away in the rocks that are under your house in your hometown. And what I'm trying to do is get people to tell me where they live and I'll reveal the stories and the rocks that are locked under your feet. So let's have a look at some rocks here that have some really great stories. We've got this, where's it gone? This one here, this is really, really beautiful. See that? Some of you might have this, this rock at home. You can tend to buy it um, at mineral and gem shops. It's called a desert rose. And it's really nice. I picked it up a few years, well, I say a few years ago, we're talking almost 25 years ago, when I was in Tunisia on a geological field trip. And these desert roses are actually made of gypsum, which is a, a mineral deposit that you see in salt lakes. So where what's happened is um, you've had a very dry, arid, desert-like environment, and there's water, which often sits, you know, water, shallow water in a basin like a salt lake. The water evaporates and it leaves a mineral behind called gypsum. And as it crystallizes, it can form a beautiful rock like that. OK, so so that's a desert rose and that's got a really wonderful story. And sometimes if you go to um, rock exposures, so, for example, if you live in the UK, we've just seen somebody pop up in the US. If you go to um, areas of wherever you live, which have Triassic deposits. And because I live in Dorset, I go to East Devon to have a look at the Triassic rocks. They're sandstones, they're rich red sandstones. And in the middle of those sandstones, you can see bands of white colored rock, and that's called gypsum. And as geologists, what we do is we look at the rocks to tell us a story of how they formed and what that environment was. In fact, if you look at the video in my series uh, entitled Exeter, you'll see a lot more about Triassic rocks and the environments those rocks formed in that will kind of explain um, what I was just talking about with that desert rose. So rocks are these fascinating time machines into all sorts of different environments that dominated the earth. Another rock that I have here, this is lovely. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this kind of rock here. This, this rock here is really, really bright, isn't it? Um, it's very powdery, it's white in color, and it's very kind of smooth, it's very dull, it doesn't shine, it doesn't sparkle. If I take it out of the light slightly, there you go. As geologists, the first thing that you do when you're trying to identify a rock is you're looking for the different properties, and that helps you to almost classify the rock itself. You'd do the same if you were a biologist or an ecologist and you were looking at an animal or a plant, you would use different characteristics of that organism to classify it. And geologists do the same with rocks. So if you're in key stage two, this is, might be something that you're doing now at school. That's all right, fun with someone. Goodbye, you can watch it later on the recorded video. So this is a rock that we know as chalk, and you can see it's really, really powdery. It's actually quite a soft rock. What's really interesting about chalk is that it forms in really kind of warm tropical seas. And what's really interesting is as I'm rubbing it, it's really soft, the chalk's coming off on my hands. I'm rubbing the dead bodies and detritus of billions and billions of microscopic algae called coccolithopores. And when I mean detritus, I mean the actual poo of the algae itself. So hundreds of millions of years ago, let's, let's say most of the chalk in this country was forming around about between 90 to kind of 64 million years ago in, during the Cretaceous period. So 90 million years ago, Britain was covered by a warm tropical sea, usually in these tropical seas. And I I'm sure you can probably find out more if you look at the rest of the Earth Live Lessons, Earth Lessons Live. There is somebody that's probably worked in a tropical sea environment what we tend to see in those tropical sea environments are, are algae blooms. And this was happening during the Cretaceous. Now, these coccolithopores that were living in the water at the time, their bodies would have, as they lived and died, their, their tiny microscopic bodies would have cascaded down through the water column and ended up on the bottom of the sea. And eventually, over time, their dead bodies and their detritus, their poo, would have built, would have, would have basically 
cemented together and formed a huge layer of chalk over time, which is what this rock is. Now, this particular rock, it has a fossil um, imprint in it already. I don't know if you can see it. The light isn't so good. Let's just see if I can get a shadow on that. It's actually the fossil. It's a fossil of a bivalve, and it's actually a seashell there. Another fossil that I've got here, which is probably a little bit clearer, this is also from the chalk. This is called a sea urchin, and I wonder if you can see it just there. You can see it's like a heart-shaped fossil, and it's got this beautiful pattern embedded on the rock itself. Try and see if I can get that better in the light. Now, sea urchins, um, you know, you've probably seen them if you've, if you've watched any kind of wildlife programs um, that have been filmed underwater, but they tend to have those spikes sticking out, don't they? Now, what's happened to this sea urchin is the spikes have fallen off, the spines, sorry, they've fallen off and they've dissolved in the water. And what we're left behind is the hard body part here, and that's the sea urchin. So when we look at, when we look at fossils like this in the rock, we know that sea urchins and particularly beautiful seashells like this, some of these creatures live in really warm tropical seas and geologists use the fossils to help us. It's almost like being like a detective and I'm a big, I'm a big crime fan. I'm, I love murder mystery. God, I love an episode of Columbo, don't you? So what we do as scientists is look for the clues to tell us about the environments in which these rocks formed and fossils like uh, sea urchins and these these kind of seashells, they are all clues to help us piece together the story of the rock. So that's fantastic. I do love, I do love a fossil. Now, I've obviously got lots and lots of different fossils here. Here's another beautiful ammonite. This is a Jurassic one. This is probably one that I picked up in Charmouth on the Dorset coast. And I think if you are interested in going fossil collecting, it's probably one of the most brilliant activities you can do once lockdown finishes and it's safe to go out onto the beaches and to go out, out and explore things. Um, if you do go fossil collecting, one of the key things is to be safe, is to check the tides, check the weather, um, and obviously keep away from the cliffs at all times because they're very crumbly and you don't want a rock to land on your head. One of my best fossils that I ever found, I was in Lyme Regis working with another colleague of mine. I found this. And this, we talked about ichthyosaurs in the feed. This is the jawbone of an ichthyosaur. And I was sitting on a big lump of uh, lias, blue lias, which is a piece of Jurassic rock as the, as the tide was going out. And I pulled this out of the soft clay that I was sitting on. And I just, I was amazed because when my colleague identified it as a piece of ichthyosaur bone, I was, at, I was like, that was the first piece of bone that I've ever found, my first ever fossil bone. So that, I, I was absolutely delighted with that. And ichthyosaurs were very prevalent in the Jurassic period. And, you know, if you're lucky enough, you might find one if you go fossil collecting. Another really common fossil that you'll see, particularly if you go fossil collecting on the Jurassic coast, is one of these. If you don't come back with one of these, give me a call and I'll, I'll, I'll shout at you over the phone. Because <laughs> belemnites, these are belemnites, they... They were squid-like creatures during the Jurassic. They're probably one of the easiest fossils to find on the beaches. Um, and obviously, I should say that the best time to go fossil collecting is during the winter months when the waves are really giving those cliffs a bash. That's what you need. You need really rough and stormy weather. You need waves to erode those cliffs, wash the fossils out onto the beaches, and that's where you find them. But you tend to find, if you find a belemnite like this, you're really, really lucky. What you tend to find are the belemnite fragments broken up. But I'd be surprised if you didn't walk away from a little with a little belemnite fossil the next time you go fossil collecting. I've got two minutes left. Gosh, that has been fun, hasn't it? I think another rock, finally, that I'd like to show you is a bit broken up. This is a piece of coprolite. And if you didn't know what a coprolite is, then I, I suggest you look it up. One of the things that I love to do with kids when I'm out doing uh, science communication work is to get them to touch it and rub it and smell it. And then I tell them that it's ichthyosaur poo because ichthyosaurs, their diet during the Jurassic period was full of all sorts of um, hard, they, they used to crunch away on ammonites and fish and all sorts of things. And of course, if it's going to come out the other end, you're going to get a very solid pellet of poo coming out. And that's what we tend to find. If you're lucky enough, you'll find that on the beaches at Charmouth and Lyme Regis if you ever go fossil collecting. 
So ichthyosaur poo, coprolite, that's something that you will, will go away today and tell your family over dinner. Actually, don't tell them over dinner. That's a bad idea. Um, we've got one more minute left. Oh, yep. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for all the lovely questions. Um, so what can I say? Have a look at my YouTube series, Where on Earth Do You Live? Um, that way, if your hometown is already in my series, you'll learn a lot more about the rocks under your feet. If, it, if I haven't done your town, please give me a suggestion. A really good place to start right now is to go to the British Geological Survey website. If, if you go to their geology maps online, you can put your town in or your postcode into their map and it will take you to where your town is and you can start to explore the rocks yourself under your feet. Um, it's been lovely talking to you. I've loved showing you some of the fossils and rocks from my collection. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the show. Thank you very, very much to Lizzie Daly, who asked me to uh, join you today. Um, yeah, hopefully some of you have gone away now completely inspired by the time machines that you can probably pick up if you go out for your daily exercise today. Thanks so much.